okay, there it is. I was going to say, Chris, did you check my battery? But he always does, so I knew that couldn't be it. Anyway, <laughs> sorry, just a little housekeeping going on. Um, yeah, I couldn't get my microphone to turn on there for a second, and, uh, or I did, and I didn't see it or something, whatever it is, whatever it is. You guys ready to get started today? Who remembers what we're doing today? Anybody? Y'all remember? <laughs> Y'all remember it from last week? We're in a new, we're in a new series, and, and I'm really trying to make the series last only three messages, which was last week was the first one where we covered the first three realities, and today we'll be covering the fourth reality by itself, and you'll see why uh, in just a moment if you don't already have the notes that were out there uh, and you, don't, you haven't seen the actual reality itself, you'll see why it'll have to be by itself today. And then next week, we'll do the last three. That's really what I'm planning to do. And um, I know I, I haven't covered and can't cover everything about all of the issues that are involved in all of the realities in just three messages. But I wanted to give you the, the realities in a, in, a, in a quick enough way where it could make sense to you and, and, and you could uh, understand how to experience God and see him work in your life in some real ways. And, and then as it goes forward, then we may be able to do other things that would come back and get a little bit more meat into some areas and so forth. Because it, it really is, these realities, this is, the realities are not scripture itself, obviously. I mean, they're not Bible verses themselves. They're just observations. They are, I called them last week, um, uh, coat, coat racks or, or, or hooks to hang your hat on. Um, when you're thinking about your experience with God. That's, that's what these are. And they're called, we call, I, well, they were called realities in the workbook uh, back in the early 90s. And so I think that's really a good name. It's a reality. And we looked last week and we, because we, we, we come to, we, we've come to the conclusion that all of us have certain expectations of our um, relationship with God. I mean, we, we, we desire to... Um, hear his voice. We want to um, feel his presence. We, we want to we know his will. We want to receive his power. We all have expectations of what we desire in our relationship with God. And the only source of truth is his word. So if we want to know the reality of experiencing God, we have to look at his word because it's his word that tells us if what we desire to experience is even possible. So that's what we're doing as we look at, at, at um, these realities of experiencing God. And when we go to the word, the word declares that God wants to work in our lives that God, for some reason, has chosen to accomplish his work in this world through humanity. That for some reason, God wants to work through us and do things through us and experience things with us. The first thing he did with Adam and Eve after he created them was give them some work to do, you know? Uh, and uh, subdue the earth and multiply and be fruitful and fill the earth and subdue it, you know? So God's always done that even from the very beginning. And, and when you look in the scripture, there, there were three basic similarities. Every time God spoke to his people in the word and gave them something to do, there are three similarities in, in it in each experience. And the first one was they knew it was God. Second, they knew what God was saying. And thirdly, they knew how they were to respond according to what God had said to them. So the premise of that just simply means if God used his people in the Bible and they knew he was speaking, they knew it was God, they knew what he was saying, and they knew how they were to respond to what he was saying, then God can speak to us that way because the Bible tells us that God doesn't change. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
And so if they knew and understood those things, we can know and understand those things. So what are the realities that we looked at last week? The first one is reality number one, God pursues a continuing love relationship with you that is real and personal. God created humanity for a relationship with himself. That's why we exist, because God wanted to have fellowship and wanted to have a relationship with us, a, a love relationship. And God is the one that initiates this love relationship. The scripture says, Jesus said, look, uh, you love me because I first loved you. And God pursues us with this continuing love relationship, and this is what he desires to have. So reality two then becomes God is always at work around me. God, the fact is, God has always been at work. The very first verse of the first book in the Bible says, in the beginning, God created. So God was working in the beginning. He's been working since then. As a matter of fact, before the beginning. I'm not sure what God might have been doing, but I'm, I'm sure he was work, working even before the beginning. The Bible doesn't tell us what God was doing before the beginning, but from the beginning he was working and he'll work all the way through until the final judgment. And then I'm sure there'll be some work after that, but he'll be doing it. God's always at work around us. Reality number three is God invites you to join him in what he's doing. We don't pray and ask God, God, what can I do for you? And then say, all right, help me do it. <laughs> no, God is already at work and God is doing something and God invites us to get involved with him in what he's already doing. And reality number four today is God speaks to me by the Holy Spirit. How, all right, God invites me to join him. All right, how does he do this? How, how do we hear him? God speaks by the Holy Spirit through the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church. That just means not just church like a service. It means other Christians, other believers, our, our fellow partners in the kingdom, and the church to reveal himself, his purposes, and his ways. Jesus, in teaching about his soon departure to the disciples, made a really interesting observation, and I wanna share this just one verse with you about this. Jesus, Jesus said in John 8, 47, he who is of God hears God's words, therefore, you do not hear because you are not of God. And I read this verse because one critical point to understanding and experiencing God is for us to know clearly that God is speaking. One truth that is certainly evident to us today all throughout the Bible is that God spoke to his people. So we need to clearly know when God is speaking to us. So God, God has always spoken to his people. Look in Hebrews chapter one, one of my favorite verses, because I love the poetry, the words in it, but of course this is the new King James. The old King James used the words uh, uh, sundry times and divers manners. You know, that was the way, that's the way Hebrews one reads. But this is what it means. God, who at various times, and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers by the prophets. So God spoke a lot of ways in the Old Testament, right? I mean, God spoke from a, a burning bush. God spoke from a mountaintop. God spoke out of a cloud. God spoke out of a, a, a pillar of fire. God even used a donkey to talk and he, and he gave dreams and he gave visions where he led the, 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 the heroes of the Old Testament and he spoke. So God spoke in those days, in those ways, verse two has in these last days, the days that this was written, spoken to us by his son, whom he has appointed heir of all things through whom also he made the world. So, Hebrews is just identifying the fact 
that God has always spoken to his people and, and how God spoke in the Old Testament is not the most important factor. The most important factor is, is that he spoke and that he led his people and he talked to them even before the Holy Spirit was given on this earth. Now, there are four important factors in uh, dealing with uh, how God speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. Here's the first one, A. Now, we're gonna use just as an example, and I'm not gonna read the story, but we all know the story, I'm sure, about Moses and the burning bush, right? You know, Moses was running from God, uh, running, running from the, the Egyptians because he had killed an Egyptian, but he was a Hebrew that had been brought up as an Egyptian. He runs to the backside of the desert and starts tending sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law. And he's out there in the field tending the sheep and he notices the bushes on fire. And that wasn't unusual for the desert. Bushes burn out in the desert all the time. What was unusual was that the bush did not burn up. It was not consumed. So Moses watches it for a, you know, a few minutes and then he says, wait a minute, that, what is that? That bush isn't burning up. And he goes over there and he stands in front of it. And when he stands in front of it, God's voice comes out of the bush and starts talking to Moses. And he tells Moses what's going to happen and what he wants Moses to do and to go to Egypt and rescue the people. And, and the whole conversation of everything that's going on. All right, we're going to use that to show us uh, these, uh, these four important factors in regards to uh, knowing his voice and knowing his God. All right, the first, first important fact, when God spoke, it was usually unique to the individual. Now, I don't want to make too much and go too long in, in this, but when God, when God spoke in the Old Testament, like some, some of these things that we named, the bush, the mountain, you know, the pillar of fire, the cloud, uh, donkey, what, it, when God spoke, it was unique to the individual. In other words, there was no precedence for it. When the voice of God came out of that bush that was on fire, Moses could not turn to the manual and say, well, look at here. Okay, God spoke out of a bush. All right, yeah, okay, all right, God, go ahead. No, because there was no, that was the first time he ever spoke out of a bush, and he never spoke out of a bush again, as far as we know. And so when God speaks to an individual, it's always unique to that individual to that individual. And, it, and it's because God wants our encounters with him to be personal. Uh, remember, he's pursuing a relationship with us and he wants us to personally experience him in a, in a unique way. All right, second, second factor. When God spoke, the person was sure that God was speaking. Moses didn't have any trouble hearing God and when he began to speak, God, Moses knew that it was God talking to him. One of the first things God said is, take off your shoes, Moses, because you're on holy ground. Uh, yes, sir. <laughs> you know, yeah, I mean, now, there was no way that Moses could prove to anybody that it was God. When he went back and he told Jethro or, or, or his wife or, or, his, or some of the kids, uh, I'm sure they said, are you sure that that was God? Uh, it was God. I, I know it was God's voice. Because God made him aware that it was him that was speaking. And listen, God is the only one that can make you aware or me aware that it is him that is speaking to us. So we're not gonna be able to prove it to somebody, but we will know that it's God when, we, when, when God speaks to us. He made sure they knew it was him and he'll make sure, he makes sure we know it. All right, here's the third factor. When God spoke, the person knew what God said. Did Moses understand what God said? Why, well, sure he did. You say, how do you know? Well, he started arguing about it which is most of the time what we do. We, got, we have our excuses, we have our plans, we have our well, but, uh, you know, and we just get in this long discussion about the whole thing. And Moses came up with lots of excuses and God answered every one of them. So Moses clearly understood what God said. And then the last factor is when God spoke, that was an encounter with God. The fact that God spoke to Moses was an encounter with God. Wouldn't Moses have been foolish to say, 
You know, I sure hope this burning bush uh, uh, discussion we just had would, would lead me to an encounter with God. <laughs> no, that was an encounter with God. I mean, when, when God reveals truth to you, by whatever means he reveals that truth to you, that is an encounter with God. When you experience his presence in whatever form that is, that's not leading to an encounter. That is an encounter with God. So God spoke to his people in the Old Testament various ways. All right, God then spoke Secondly, by his son. In the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus, who is God, spoke to the people as he walked around on this earth speaking to the people. Wouldn't the disciples have been foolish to say? Well, you know, I hope that as Jesus is talking to me, that that would lead to an experience with God. That was an experience with God. As a matter of fact, they did say that one time. Uh, uh, they said, uh, uh, we would see God. And Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. I am God. You're looking right at him. You know, I don't know what you're looking for, but this is God. And so, just like Moses understood it was God speaking to him, when God spoke out of the bush, there was no... There was no precedence for that. There was no uh, recordings of that. There were no books written about that. It was just God speaking to him, and he knew it was God. And when Jesus spoke, they knew it was God. So the third, the, 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 the third way God speaks is by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is the way God speaks today. Because Jesus went back to heaven, right? Right? <laughs> and he's sitting at the right hand of God the Father right now, or he's doing whatever it is that he does in heaven until all of us get there. Uh, but, but so we can't hear his voice anymore. He's not walking around like a human and saying things to us like I'm talking to you right now. So what happened in the Bible after Jesus went home? Well, in the book of Acts and the remainder of the Bible, uh, he, uh, uh, God spoke through the Holy Spirit. And, and when, when, we, when we move to the gospel and the book of Acts and to the present, we, we quite often change our mind, mindset and we live as if somehow God quit speaking personally to his people. But we know the people in the book of Acts clearly speak were led by God and were spoken to by God. And we know that, that Paul was clearly spoken to and led by God. We know the early church and all of those letters that you get, the Philippians, the Corinthians, the Romans, and so forth, all of them were uh, spoken to and led by God personally. And so our understanding now is that God clearly speaks today just as God spoke to them and led them, and he speaks by his Holy Spirit. An encounter with the Holy Spirit is an encounter with God. John 16, verse 12, look at what Jesus said. I still have many things to say to you. This was when he was about to depart. He said, I still, he's talking to his disciples, I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. However, when he, the spirit of truth, has come, he will guide you into all truth, for he will not speak of his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will tell you things to come. He will glorify me, for he will take of what is mine and declare it to you. Now that the Holy Spirit has been given, he is the one who guides us in, the, the scripture says, in all truth, and he teaches us all the things that God wants us to know and understand, and the Holy Spirit speaks to our life. So when you study the word of God, it's like the author is, is right there helping you, helping you understand it because it's the Holy Spirit that reveals truth to you 
And when the Holy Spirit reveals truth to you, that's not leading to an encounter with God. That is an encounter with God. When the Holy Spirit speaks, then you need to respond immediately. When God spoke to Moses, what Moses did next was critical. When, God, when Jesus spoke to the disciples, what the disciples did next was critical. Our problem is that when God begins to speak to us, many times it ends up in some kind of long discussion about something. And we argue in our mind and we, you know, we put up the walls and the excuses. And all I can say is the more we talk, the longer the discussion, usually the worse it, it, it gets. Uh, Moses, as an example, had a long discussion with God at that bush about what God wanted him to do. And it led to a hindrance in, in his life for the rest of his life. God said, all right, take Aaron with you, you know? He'll get, he's a good talker, take Aaron with you. Well, Aaron was also a good idol builder, uh, <laughs> you know, a good, uh, a good undermining the authority kind of guy. I mean, it, he hindered, he wasn't an asset, he was a hindrance, and God had spoke to Moses, but Moses argued and Moses talked about it. So what you, when God speaks, what you do next is very important, is critical in life. So God could speak in many ways. God could speak in any way he wants to. I'm not limiting the fact that God could fly a bird in this building and start talking to us if he wanted to do that. Or he could do anything he wants to. He's God. But this is what he has done in the word. And this is what uh, we assume that he continues to do because this is how God leads his people by the Holy Spirit. All right? Um, that's the first part of the, 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 the reality. Let's go to the last part of the reality and leave the middle to the end, all right? God speaks by the Holy Spirit. Why does God speak to us? Because he wants to reveal something to us. What does he want to reveal to us? God wants first to reveal himself. God speaks to me by the Holy Spirit through the Bible prayer circumstances in the church to reveal himself, his purposes and his ways. He reveals himself. When God speaks by the Holy Spirit to us, he often reveals something about himself. He reveals his name. Now, I know this might not sound like a big deal, but you remember when God spoke to the prophets, God spoke to Israel as a nation, God led them, uh, Jesus walked around on this earth. Uh, there was no word of God, there was no Bible, there was no, uh, no, no, no spiritual writings of any kind that, that revealed anything about, about this awesome Jehovah God, this, this, this one God uh, that led Israel. And so when, when God would come to an individual in, in those days, he would address them by telling them his name. Now there's only one place in the Bible where God tells us what his name is. And that is when Moses said, well, who do I say sent me? And God said, you tell them I am sent you. Now that name was a name that has been recreated for us as the, as the Hebrew word Yahweh. However, it's just really a guess at that because the, the Jewish people, when God said his name and, and they wrote it down, they took out uh, the vowels so it could never be pronounced. That, the name of God was too holy for them to even say his name. And so they took the vowels out and all you have left is Y-H-W-H. <laughs> now we've put some vowels back in uh, so we could say it and we assume it was Yah, put an A and the an E, Yahweh. And that means, that means uh, the holy God, the, the I am God, the, the, the proper name of God. 
But when God, all the other names of God in the Bible are names that people made up in order to describe God out of their experience with God. Like Jehovah. Jehovah is a covenant name. It means the God who makes a covenant. And when, and when the name Jehovah, when God revealed his name as Jehovah, then whoever experienced something put another name to it and called him like Jehovah Nisi. Well, Jehovah Nisi means the covenant God who's like a banner flying over me. Jehovah Shalom, Shalom means peace. It's the covenant God who gives me peace. <laughs> you know, Rapha means healing. So he's the covenant God who heals me. And so it was by experience that people, I'm mean, just for lack of a better word, nicknamed God. And when God would come to them, God would speak one of those names so that the person who he was speaking to would be able to have enough faith to believe that whatever God was about to say to them, God was able to do through them. An example, Abram. Abram was... Later, who later became Abraham, was a fat cat in Mesopotamia, living in a, a city called Ur. And uh, I mean, how would you like to be from Ur? Where are you from, Ur? Uh, Ur? <laughs> like you can't, Ur, Ur what? You, like you can't remember? You know, Ur? No. But he was rich and he was a heathen. I mean, he didn't know God. There was no, there was no relationship with God. And God said, all right, come on, Abraham. I got, you, I got somewhere for you to go. Well, all right, well, where are we going? Well, I'll tell you when we get there. Um, uh, how long is it going to take? Well, uh, you'll see when we get there. Well, how are we going to know we're there? Well, I'll talk about that when we get there. And he starts following God and, and Sarah and his whole family. And his name was Abram. Now, Abram means exalted father. And God came to him and made a covenant and said, if you, if you will go with me, then I'm going to do this. And it, there were seven things that he promised them, you know. And one of them was, what, what was, was a land and that he would have enough, his children would be as the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. And he changed his name to Abraham, which means father of many nations. <laughs> but Abraham didn't have a son, <laughs> Imagine how embarrassing that was. You go into a place and they say, what's your name? And uh, Abraham. Oh, man, how many children do you have? Uh, none. None. Man, what a joke. Uh, you know, and, 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 so, and so when God spoke to him about having a son, God revealed a name to him, which was God Almighty. Now, God Almighty comes from a Hebrew word that means that, that, all, that translates El Shaddai. You've heard the name El Shaddai. You heard Amy Grant sing it. Uh, what was it? Uh, long ago, if you live long enough to know Amy Grant, know who Amy Grant is, and she was a Christian singer. El Shaddai, El Shaddai, El Eliana Adonai. That age to age, that's the name of the song, yeah. Age to age, you're still the same by the power of your name. Okay, see, y'all thought I didn't know it, right? I was making it up. El Shaddai. All right, El Shaddai, you know what, how, it literally, how El Shaddai literally translates? Many-breasted. I am the many-breasted God. Why would he say that to Abraham? Because he just told him, you're going to have so many children, they'll be like the sands of the sea and the stars of the sky. And, you, and, and I'm just saying, look, I can take care of all of you because I have enough resources to take care of everything. And he used that name because he wanted Abraham to have enough faith to believe that he was able to do anything he needed to do to make Abraham successful in what he was asking him to do. So when God comes to us, he reveals some things to us that encourage our personal relationship with him and encourage us to believe that he can accomplish these things through us. And the first thing that he reveals is his name. The second thing that he reveals are his purposes. 
God reveals his purposes so you will know what he plans to do. I mean, if, if, if you are going to join him in what he's doing, in order to join him in what he's doing, you're going to have to know, well, what's he doing? I mean, you don't think that God came to Noah and said, uh, <clears throat> hey, Noah, I want you to think up something to do for me. All right? Not anything, it be anything. Well, just, just think up something you want to do for me. No, when God came to Noah, God came to Noah to reveal to Noah what he was about to do. And did, and did Noah need to know this information? Well, sure he did. What if Noah had spent the next hundred years passing out gospel tracts in the city instead of building an ark? Everybody would have died. There would have been no ark and there would be no humanity left on this earth. So God reveals about what he plans to do. And, and the reason God doesn't tell us any more than he does is because once we hear a little bit of what God is doing, we want to take off running with it. Like, oh, okay, this is what God, oh, all right, God, I got it, I got it. Oh, yeah, hey, no, oh, no, I'll get back with you. I got it. I, look, I'll take care of this. I know just exactly what to do. And I, that's us. If God told us more than he tells us, we would be running away from him trying to, trying to do whatever it is he showed us in that little track. And we would really run away from the personal relationship, which is what God is after to start with. The reason God wants us to work with him is so that he can be with us and we can experience him and we can be personal with him. And we can have unique experiences with him. Oh, he could do everything by himself. He's God. But he chooses not to. He chooses to involve us in what he's doing. So when he speaks by the Holy Spirit, he, he reveals himself and he reveals his purposes. And then he reveals, lastly, his ways. Now, purposes and ways are two different things. God's purpose was to save the world. God's way was to kill his son on a cross. That way was brutal. That way was terrible. That way was harsh. But that was the only way God could accomplish the purpose of saving the world. So God reveals his ways to us. And does he need to do this? Well, according to Isaiah 55, oh, let, let, let's just read it. Uh, for my thoughts, this is God speaking, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts higher than your thoughts. So God has to reveal his ways because we would never know the way of God. And the only way what he's doing can be accomplished is to be accomplished in his way. Because here's, what, because here's us, uh, a couple of chapters back in Isaiah 53, 6. This is us. All we like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord's laid on him the iniquity of all. We all have ways. And we all think our ways are best. And we want to do things our way. God says, look, if you do what I'm about to open to you, your way, uh, you may have some moderate success. But when we try to do the work of God in our ways, we will never see and experience the the, the mighty power of God in our life. And people will not see the mighty power of God. The reason people are not impressed with God is because they don't see God. What they see is a bunch of nice people doing good things because they're good people. And they, frankly, they're just really not impressed with that. that. That doesn't matter to them. 
But when we do things that God invites us to in his way, his mighty power is released so that uh, people see something that could only be done by God. I mean, an example in the scripture. Uh, it, it, we're on the Mount of Olives. Jesus is teaching. The sun's beginning to come. It's getting late in the afternoon. The disciples come to Jesus and say, send them home, Jesus, because they they're starving. They need something to eat. And Jesus said, all right, we'll feed them. And the disciples said, uh, we don't have anything. And, we got, and our bank account's low. Look, you know. Uh, Judas probably had been making some withdrawals by that time. And they just ran, he kept it down tight. Uh, we don't have enough money to buy all this food. And so Jesus said, all right, go out there and see what you can find. Bring me back. Yeah. And they found one little boy with his little lunch, five loaves, two fishes. And uh, they said, but what is that among so many? <laughs> Come on, this is ridiculous, Jesus. Jesus said, give it to me. And he blessed it. And then he broke it. And he started, he gave the, the 12, one, two, gave pieces to all 12. He said, all right, get out there. And, and, and uh, we sit them down in 50s. And they sit there, there. Those are yours. Then sit these down. Those are yours. Uh, now go feed them. And I'm sure they're walking out there like this right here, holding, thinking all the way, what in the world? I mean, I gonna give this to the first person and that's it. And then he gave it to the first person and then the second. And, and, and it's just multiplying as, as he picks it off. It just, I guess it just reappears or something on it. I don't know, I don't know how that thing worked, but it, it never ran out. Everybody there, I mean, they didn't just eat, to eat a little bit. They ate all they wanted. And then there were 12 baskets full left over as take home. One basket for every disciple, I guess. Now, to do it, the disciples' way meant send those people home because we hadn't got enough for them. But to do it God's way was bring me that here and let me bless it and I'm going to take care of all of these people. And when he did, oh man, the word spread everywhere. As a matter of fact, he had to end up running some people off because there were so many following him and he looked at them. This is a really, uh, I love this passage, what it says, because it's so uh, revealing. Uh, Jesus, there's a bunch of people with Jesus and, and, um, and the Bible says, and that day, many of them committed themselves to him, but he did not commit himself to them for he knew their hearts and he knew that they followed him for the loaves and fishes. See, Jesus knows what motivates you. You might think you're tricking him, but he knows you. But the point is that God reveals himself. He reveals his purposes and he reveals his ways so that we can walk with him and accomplish what he wants to accomplish with us tagging along and helping in some way. All right, now let's talk about the four ways that God speaks to us. Four ways the Holy Spirit speaks to us. All right, and remember now, he can speak any way he wants to. I'm not trying to limit God in any way, and God can do anything he wants to do and talk. He could just start speaking out of that light bulb right now if he wanted to. But these are the four ways that primarily that God has chosen to speak to us in these days that we're in. The first, God, first one is God speaks through the Bible. Now, I'm gonna give you a passage in 1 Corinthians 2, and, and, and let's read it together. Beginning at verse 13. These things we also speak, not in words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Spirit teaches, comparing spiritual things to spiritual, to spiritual but the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him. Nor can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. But he who is spiritual judges all things, yet he himself is rightly judged by no one. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he may instruct him? But we have the mind of Christ." 
So the Bible is God's word. The Bible was written by God. The Bible was written to show us God and to show us the way God works. And the word says that you cannot understand his words if you're not, if you're not, if it's not revealed by the Holy Spirit to you. You just can't understand things. They're foolishness to you unless the Holy Spirit opens up that word and reveals something to, to you. And remember, uh, the truth is not, is not discovered. The truth is revealed. And when the Holy Spirit gets ready to reveal truth to you, often he uses the word of God to reveal that truth to you either by your personal reading or somebody preaching it or somebody studying it or in some way God reveals things to you that you did not know. And maybe you've even read that section of the Bible many, many times and it never dawned on you. It never touched you. There was no instruction. Uh, let, me, let me give you an example of one. This is just a little generic example so it's not gonna really hurt anybody. All right, um, uh, Psalm 37. Psalm 37 is a tremendous psalm. It, it's full of good stuff. Like, like I, did I put them on the verse? Yeah. All right, these, the, all of these things, next four or five things are, are things that are in Psalm 37, just, just in there. Delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. But the meek shall inherit the earth and shall delight themselves in the abundance of peace. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord and he delights in his way. I have been young and now I'm old, yet I've not seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. I mean, all of those tremendous verses are there and, and many more. But let's just say you're reading Psalm 37 and you come to verse 21. And in verse 21, you read this. The wicked borrows and does not repay, but the righteous shows mercy and gives. So you've read Psalm 37 many times, but today for some reason, when you read verse 21, you remember that you owe somebody a debt that you have never repaid. And you realize now that this scripture applies to you, that that's you that's being talked. The wicked <laughs> do not repay. And the, what has happened is the Holy Spirit has just spoken to you using a verse in the Bible to speak to you. It is the Holy Spirit that is convicting you about the fact that you have a debt that you haven't paid. So you are having an encounter with the Holy Spirit. And an encounter with the Holy Spirit is an encounter with God. Now, how many times have you, has that kind of thing happened to you? Many times I submit to you. Many times, God just has revealed and it's the Holy Spirit that teaches us in all truth. And then now you understand that, that to borrow and to not repay is a sin and, and, and the Holy Spirit is convicting you of sin because remember, it's only God, there's some things only God can do and one of the things only God can do is convict you of sin. I said like, we could make each other mad, but God can convict us of sin. So what you do next is crucial. Three things. You agree with the truth that, you just, that God just showed you you agree that it applies to you. You adjust your understanding now to the truth that God has just revealed to you. And then you go repay your debt. Obey. All right, God speaks by the Bible. God speaks through prayer. 1 Corinthians 2, 10, 11, 12. I has not seen nor ear, but as it is written, I has not seen nor ear heard nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his spirit. For the spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. For what man can know the things of man except the spirit of the man which is in him? Even so, no one knows the things of God except the spirit of God 
Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God that we might know the things that have been freely given to us by God. In other words, the reason the Holy Spirit has to speak to you is because the Holy Spirit is the only one who knows what God wants to do. You don't know what God wants to do. You couldn't know what God wants to do. It's not revealed to you. Eye has not seen, ear has not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man, the things of God. But the Holy Spirit knows what God wants to do and the Holy Spirit lives in you and the Holy Spirit will lead you to understand what it is God wants to do. And so when you pray, part of your prayer, part of being in prayer is to talk to God because prayer is a relationship, it's not an activity. I mean, look, when you were dating, when you were dating, um, was it drudgery to call your honey on the phone and talk to her or him? No, it wasn't drudgery. You loved it. As a matter of fact, when Pastor Tanya and I were dating, of course, cell phones were non-existent and so forth. We barely had a telephone, telephone but, but I mean, I would spend uh, half the night until her parents ran me off out there with her and then as soon as I got home, I'd get up back on the phone. She'd be st standing by the phone, so as soon as it rang, she could pick it up, and they, wouldn't, they would, wouldn't be able to hear it, and then we'd talk another hour or two or something. I mean, that wasn't drudgery, you know, and, and when I talked to her, I wasn't talking to get facts. You know, hey, uh, now where do you live? Uh, yeah, okay, and uh, what's on the corner of your house? Yes, okay, I got that. Did you paint? I mean, it, it wasn't that kind of conversation. It was, a, it was an intimate conversation because I had a personal relationship with her. This is the way God wants to talk to us and us to talk to him. Think of your relationship with God just like that. It, it's a two-way communication. And you talk to God and God talks to you and, and, and God wants us to pray because in praying, we adjust ourselves to God. Look, look, you pray to, to adjust yourself to God, not to get God to adjust to you. And so I pray and, and, and I adjust my thinking and my, my, my actions to God. And God doesn't need us to pray, but he wants us to pray because the very act of praying itself is an experience with him is a personal experience with him. So let me give you the encounter sequence. Uh, hey, man, we got a little bit of time, not much, but let me give you the, the encounter secret, uh, uh, sequence. Here, here this just, I'm gonna go through it quickly now. All right, number one, God takes the initiative by causing you to want to pray. Remember, there's some things only God can do. One of them is only God can make you want to seek him. Uh, if you're hungry for God, if you, if you need God, it's because God created that in you. Only God can do that. So he creates uh, the initiative to, for you by causing you to want to pray. Then the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and reveals to you the will of God and you need this because you often pray for one thing but get another. H have that ever happened to you? That you... You pray for one thing, but that's not what you get. You, you get something else. So the Holy Spirit has to kind of straighten out your thinking about this thing. So he usually takes the word of God and straighten out your thinking. Like, uh, here's one uh, that happened to the disciples in Mark 2. You know, the, they, were, they had a, a, a crippled guy laying on a stretcher and they went to the house where Jesus was teaching and they couldn't get in because there were people packed all in and out in the yard everywhere. So they had the bright idea, all right, what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go up on the roof of the house and we're gonna tear a hole in the roof and we're gonna let the man down right there in front of Jesus because he needs to be healed. So they, their desire they, was that he be healed. What, but what happened when he got lowered through the roof and got in front of Jesus? Did Jesus say, all right, you're healed, get up off that thing? No, Jesus looked at him and Jesus said, man, your sins be forgiven you. Well, that's not what they prayed for. 
What they prayed for was Jesus healed, get up. Jesus, Jesus does something that they totally did not expect for him to do. And that happens to us a lot. And it's only God's word that can teach us these kind of things that, you know, God has a better plan. You wanted a particular gift, but Jesus wanted to make the man a child of God so that he could inherit everything. See, God's ways are not our ways and his thoughts are not our thoughts. So second, the Holy Spirit takes the word of God and reveals you the will of God. Third, in the spirit, you pray in agreement with the will of God. Fourth, you adjust your life to the truth that God's just revealed to you. Fifth, you look and listen for confirmation or further direction from the Bible, circumstances, and the church or the believers. You obey and God works in you to accomplish his purpose. That's the sequence of prayer and how God uses prayer and God speaks in prayer. They all end, have you noticed this? They all end it with obedience. You have to obey. <laughs> yeah, you're going, if you want to experience him, you, you, gotta, you gotta obey, right? All right, all right. God speaks through circumstances and I'm just gonna take this really quick. Um, John chapter five, we've read this passage last week. Uh, and maybe even the week before, but just I want to use it just to uh, start talking about circumstances here a second. But Jesus answered them, my father has been working until now and I've been working. Then Jesus answered and said to them, most assuredly I say to you, the son can do nothing of himself but what he sees the father do. For whatever he does, the son also does in like manner. For the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. Jesus is just saying, I watch what my father does and where my father goes. And, and I just, I go where he goes and I do what he does. Uh, Zacchaeus is a good example of this. You talk about circumstances, putting you in the right place to hear God and, and obey. Jesus is walking down the street and the crowd is just packed around him. And there's this little tiny man, a tax collector named Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus wants to see Jesus. So he has, to, he has this bright idea, I'm gonna climb up in that sycamore tree and that limb goes out of the road. I'm gonna get out on that limb and then I can see him when he comes by. Well, evidently, God <laughs> wanted something done in Zacchaeus' life. So now God has him out on the limb right there where Jesus is and as Jesus walks under the limb, the father must have said to the son, look up, son. Oh, there's a little man up there. Uh, our, our, kid, our children's song calls him a wee little man, was he? And, oh, there's a man up there. All right. Uh, get him down and, and invite him. And, and he's going to invite you home and you go home with him. And, uh, and Jesus said, all right, come down, Zacchaeus. And then Jesus went home with Zacchaeus. And what happened at Zacchaeus' house? All of Zacchaeus' little uh, tax collector buddies were there and all of the friends and, and every one of them, every one of them committed themselves to Christ. Now, circumstances, wh where you are, what's happening around you, uh, where God leads you, what God says to you, things that happen to you. I mean, even bad things sometimes that happen. God uses them. I know that's painful, but God uses even negative circumstances. So God uses circumstances. And then the last use of God here is God speaks through the church. Uh, other Christians, spiritual people in your life, not just necessarily in this building. Because Jesus is the head of the church. We meet for his purposes and we are his body. As a matter of fact, let me just read you. Let's, let's pass by, well, no, let's, let me read both of them. I've got, they're a little lengthy, but we'll move on. Ephesians 4, this is about the church now, Ephesians 4, 14. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown. Oh, by the way, this is the New Living Translation. This is not a paraphrase, it's a translation. But that ver these verses out of Ephesians were so, are so... Uh, complicated and confusing if you don't read them out of something that's pretty contemporary that you know helps you. Um, it, it, I, I, want, I just wanted you to get the message, so that's why it's out of the New Living. 
then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. It helps the other parts grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Now, this next passage is out of Corinthians, and it talks about us all being part of the same body. And Naley, if you'll go down um, to, the, to verse 22 or so, let me just start there. The verses prior to this talk about how God has put us together as a body, and we all need each other. And you can't say just because I'm not, I'm, I want to be an eye. Well, because I'm not an eye, I'm not part of the body. Uh, no, I want to be an ear. Well, because I'm not an ear, then uh, I'm not part of the body. No one can say that because there, God puts you where he wants you to and God, um, and God de decides who needs to do what and who needs what gift and who needs what uh, opportunity and so forth. All right, verse 22, are we there? Yeah, 21, 22. All right. The eye can never say to the hand, I don't need you. The head can't say to the feet, I don't need you. In fact... Some parts of the body that seem weakest and least important are actually the most necessary. And the parts we regard as less honorable are those we clothe with the greatest care. So we carefully protect those parts that, sh that, that should not be seen. While the more honorable parts do not require this special care. So God has put the body together such that extra honor and care are given to those parts that have less dignity. This makes for harmony among the members so that all the members care for each other. If one part suffers, all the parts suffer with it. If one part is honored, all the parts are glad. All of you together are Christ's body and each of you is a part of it. Now this is, this is God's church and what God does with his church is he takes care of all of us in this body. We take care of each other. We, we discipline each other. We honor each other. We correct each other. We supervise each other. Uh, we all have certain skills and our certain skill has been given to us so that it can meet a need in the body so that the body is sufficient to do what Christ has for it to do. And he calls us in and we're a part and when we do what that part does, it makes everything work right. So many times we speak to each other and we say things to each other out of our gift that God has given us. Not in some grandiose prophetic way, you know, thus saith God. Let me tell you, God. No, you just say something. You, just, you may not even be thinking about anything, but it gives some direction. It gives, how many of you have ever heard anything just uh, accidentally that became an answer there's a question you had or a search that you were in. Yeah, because it was said by somebody who's gifted in that way and their strength answered your question or gave you some direction or pushed you forward in some way. Or maybe it's a sit down and counsel with somebody and say, here's my problem. And then God opens it up and God speaks through them. I mean, God, sometimes my voice sounds like God's voice. I know that's frightening to hear. But sometimes God sounds just like me. And sometimes God sounds just like you. And your mother-in-law. I mean, heaven forbid. You know, your children. <laughs> yeah. I mean, God's voice sounds like our voice because God's used, God uses our voice to guide us and direct us. So that's, those are the four primary ways God speaks through the Holy Spirit, the Bible, prayer, circumstances, and the church to reveal himself, his, his purposes, and his ways. All right, all right. Does all that make sense? Did I just cloud it up for you? It makes any sense? Okay, all right, very good. All right, let me have a word of prayer. Um,